Emotions were running high that evening as Jesus gathered the disciples together. He knew his days on earth were numbered, and so he gathered those closest to him to share a meal around the table. As they finished eating, Jesus stood up and he gathered a towel and a basin full of water. Then moving to kneel at the feet of one of his friends, he began washing their feet clean with the water and drying them with the towel. Then moving on to kneel at the feet of another, repeating the washing and the drying, on and on this went until he had served them all, even the one he knew would betray him. He shared a gentle, caring, intimate moment with each and every one of them. It was hard for some to accept, while others seemed stunned by the beauty of the moment. Some were overwhelmed with affection for their teacher. Some felt unworthy. Still others had no words, only tears. Having loved his own, he loved them to the end. You see, things for Jesus and his disciples had gotten especially difficult over the last couple of weeks. All of the rumors, the hopes, and the fears about who Jesus was had been building and building over the time of his ministry, and now they were coming to a boil. Just a little more than a week ago, Jesus had visited his friends, Mary and Martha and Lazarus, in their home in the town just outside of Jerusalem. But when Jesus arrived in Bethany, he learned that Lazarus had unexpectedly died just days before. Through his own tears, he went to his friend's tomb and commanded Lazarus to live. And his friend rose from the grave, walked out of the tomb, and carried on living. A few days later, Jesus returned to Lazarus, Mary, and Martha's home for one last visit before going to Jerusalem. Jesus had started to increasingly talk about being away from them, hinting at his impending death. His visit was overshadowed by a growing sense of urgency and grief. Everyone knew that there was a bounty out for him. Mary could see death coming for him, so she poured out an expensive bottle of perfume and anointed his body in preparation. The end of his life was coming fast now, and as if that wasn't terrifying enough for his disciples and friends, there was a bounty out for Lazarus, too. Not only was Jesus seen as a threat that needed to be silenced, but those who witnessed and testified on his behalf were now considered too, too dangerous to let live either. The sadness and fear must have been palpable in the room that evening as Jesus washed their feet. Their emotions swirling, their fight or flight reflexes kicking in, their minds racing. Each of us who have sat alongside someone we love as they stare down death, knows these feelings. I've been struck by the beauty of the Reverend Dr. Jackie Lewis's reflections on how she experienced the death of her own mother and the continued experience of that loss in her now. The month of April not only marks her mother's birthday and wedding anniversary, but also the anniversary of the day of her death. Mix in there Easter celebrations of resurrection and Mother's Day too, and Jackie has been especially mindful of her mother these days. She talks about this time being super painful. And also she talks about how she has never felt more faith in the resurrection than she does now. She says, I feel like I feel her all the time. She's here, not wait till heaven or reign of God, but I feel her all the time now. And I feel also the absence of her 
I can smell her and almost feel the arthritis in her hands. It's strange, but it's true. At first, Jackie made sense of these feelings, thinking that with all the hurt in the world, she must be trying to get back to the security of the womb, to be held by the love of her mother. But that didn't quite fit her experience. It isn't that she's going backwards to when her mother was alive. It is that Jackie is going forward with her mother in a new way and in an intimate way. Her mother is accompanying her as she moves forward with life. As difficult as her grief is over her mother, she also appreciates that she knows her now in a new way in a way where there is nothing between them. What a beautiful blessing this is for Jackie. Having shared those final moments of personal connection with the disciples, Jesus says to them, do you know why I have done these things? I've done them to show you by example how you are to serve others in love. He won't allow them to be overwhelmed by their fear. He calls them back to love. On this last night with them, he's doing what he's been doing all along, like what he was doing when he dined with Nicodemus or took a drink of water from the Samaritan woman or healed the man born blind or fed the unprepared crowd or taught in the temple or raised Lazarus from the dead, or welcomed Mary's extravagant gift. In every question answered, in every truthful word spoken, in every meal shared, in every boundary crossed in order to know and to welcome someone into the pasture of God's love and provision, in every single moment of his life and his work, he has been teaching by example just how those who follow him are to live. In case his example wasn't clear enough, he states it simply and clearly when he says to them, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should love one another. Love is the beginning of the scripture passage, and love is the ending, too. The same can be said for the life and the ministry of Jesus. Love was the beginning, and he lived the way of love right up to the very end. And that love didn't just disappear when he was no longer living. Knowing he didn't have much time left with them, Jesus spends the rest of that night before he was arrested talking with them. He says all the last bits of the things he wants them to know before they face what is ahead. He leaves them with two core messages. The first core message is that message of love. If you love me, you will keep my commandment to love one another just as I have loved you you. He is not only reaffirming his love for each and every one of them, but he is telling them to carry on what he has taught them and shown them and told them. To keep on loving with the kind of fierceness that frees people to experience firsthand the abundant life of God. To keep on loving others across boundaries and barriers in a way that sees and honors and welcomes the other into the fellowship. To keep on loving even in the face of betrayal, bending down to wash the feet of the very one who would destroy us. And this is how the world will know we are followers of Jesus, the one who taught us to love. They will know it by our love. Facing the end of his life, love 
is what Jesus wants to live on after him. Love is the message he gives them. Love is his legacy. And because of his love, he will not leave his disciples to carry on alone. His second core message is one of comfort and of promise. He tells them that he is sending another advocate, the spirit of truth, to be with them. In the original Greek language, this scripture was written in, the word translated here as advocate is parakletos, a funny word in its English form, paraclete. It's a word that is notoriously difficult to translate because it, in fact, holds within it a whole multitude of meanings. Advocate isn't a bad translation. It just doesn't capture all of it. Paraclete means advocate, but also comforter, counselor, and helper. This Holy Spirit is one who comes along us to teach us, remind us, abide with us, and to testify about Jesus. Like Jesus, the paraclete, the Holy Spirit, deals in truth, which makes sense since Jesus says he's sending another advocate to be with them, another. He was the first to come alongside, teaching, reminding, abiding, and testifying, and he will not leave them abandoned. The Holy Spirit will come alongside them. While this is good news of comfort to our hearts, this is where our minds can start to struggle. Volumes have been written about the Trinity, about the role and relationship of God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We try and rationalize and understand the Trinity, striving to determine how much they are the same and how much they are independent of one another, it is difficult stuff. So forgive me. I may really be adding a layer more to this than your mind can receive this moment. So I invite you to listen, not with your head, but with your heart. The Holy Spirit isn't only with you. The Holy Spirit is within you. Jesus says to those who follow him that they will, be, they will know the spirit of truth because the Holy Spirit abides with them and will be in them. Jesus says, you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. Or a few sentences beyond our scripture for today, Jesus says it this way, those who love me will keep my word and my Father will love them and we will come to them and we will make our home with them. It's not just the Trinity, friends. It's a quartet of love. Beloved ones, those first disciples, nor any of us who follow Jesus, walk this way of love alone. For he walks alongside as the spirit of truth. As painful as it is to grieve his death and to feel his absence, we do not have to wait until heaven or reign of God to feel him with us because his spirit, the spirit of truth, is with us, within us, even now. And perhaps like Jackie is experiencing with her mother, we might feel his presence in a new way as he accompanies us as we move forward together in life. Nothing in between us. A world to love before us. His death wasn't the end of his love revolution. We are called to continue it this day and each of our days. May we be faithful in following his way of love. Amen.